Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Melissa K. Norris, who is a fifth generation homesteader, author, and educator in Washington. Melissa inspires and guides through thousands of fellow homesteaders through her website, podcast, and books on creating a self-sustaining home and kitchen to help further preserve the old ways of farm-to-table living. Melissa, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Michael. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So you, you call yourself a fifth generation. Talk a little bit about what that kind of meant for you growing up and then kind of what that meant for your the previous generations. Yeah. Well, you know, it's really funny because honestly, I never had heard the to- term homesteader growing mm-hmm. up outside of, of course, the historical, the Homesteading Act in the United States that was back in, in the 1800s. Yes. And so we just, we lived very rurally, still do. So my dad, we had our own herd of grass-fed, grass-finished beef before it was cool. And that's honestly because we did not have the means to grow grain. We didn't have the extra funds to grow grain. It wasn't a decision at that time that was based on health implications like now it was just we didn't have the money to buy grains Mm -hmm. or to buy pesticides if we even wanted to or herbicides so i come from a long line of just people who lived close to the land who raised their own food truthfully out of necessity Uh, my father was born during the great depression so therefore he was a child during the great depression and, and raised through that era but even after the Great Depression ended, as he you know moved into his teen years and on, it didn't really change the way that they lived. And so they always were producing their own food and buying very minimal from the stores simply because that was mm-hmm. how they provided for themselves. So it was funny yeah. because it wasn't until later that uh, you know I started on a, online a website and a blog and, and that and then realized, oh, modern homesteading is actually what we have been doing and the lifestyle we've been living. I just didn't know that that was the the terminology um, to use. And so then it was like, I found my people, you know, and people started coming together under that. So that's been really fun. But yeah, so I say fifth generation homesteader simply just because as far back as I can trace on both sides of my mother and my father's family tree and going back those generations, I mean, honestly much further back than that but i'm like okay i can legitimately go back this many generations and say yeah they were you know raising their own food uh you know doing all of those things that encompass being self-sufficient as much as possible uh, with homesteading so yeah gotcha yeah so then talked about growing up when you were growing up did you guys have a big garden your own milk cow what did that look like yeah so funnily enough we did not have a milk cow when i was growing up um so i am one of 10 children and most of the kids were out of the house by the time I was born. And so the milk cow that we had was retired. She was a retired milk cow and she got to live out her, her life on the farm, even though she was no longer being milked. Mm-hmm. But we raised a big garden. My mom always canned. We always planted a really large garden. We'd go out and forage wild blackberries, different fruit, things like that. Uh, always had homemade jam and jelly and, and pies and all of those things. And then my dad raised, as I said, the beef. And so we always had beef. And it's really funny. By the time, as I said, that I came along, my dad wasn't raising chickens anymore. He kind of scaled back a little bit um, after my seven older uh, siblings had moved out. And so it was a luxury that we ever got to have poultry because we weren't raising it. And I know for a lot of people that was the reverse back then, but like, man, if we got to have chicken, like that was a special night. Uh, We just had beef all of the time. So very much raised on in a, a, you know, country farming environment where there was the garden was going and we had the beef cattle. So there was all, all that entails of that with raising your own grass fed, grass finished beef herd. Mm -hmm. But isn't that actually, you know, the whole, uh, is it an idiom or what it's called, the a chicken in every pot, wasn't that because beef at one point was far cheaper than chicken because chicken required grain to grow and beef was just grass? Yeah. I mean, historically, yeah, you look at that and then, yeah, we've kind of had that switch now, right? Where beef 
um, is more expensive than chicken, though everything, it feels like it depends on what day you go to the grocery store, <laughs> yes. uh, where, where prices and stuff landed in this moment in time. But yeah, his, historically, you're right. It was the, the flop of was, that. Yeah, which yeah. is interesting. It, it comes down to government subsidies on grain and so many other factors, but... <laughs> We, yeah. that's a yeah, whole other episode of, <laughs> that is like we could have fun with that it's a big soapbox of mine but yeah yes. there's lots of factors there but that that is is a, a true statement yeah okay so now growing up obviously i know a lot of kids they grow up this really you know like i would say minimalistic way of being on the farm the homestead farmstead and they don't want to have anything to do with that was there a stage that you went through like that yeah that's a great question i didn't really have a stage where i didn't want anything to do with it but that is very true like i look at as i said i'm one of i'm one of 10 kids i have two younger siblings and then i have seven older older siblings and of the 10 of us now that we're all adults and have families of our own etc there's really only three of us that are really homesteading and 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 doing this lifestyle so you know there you go that's what 30 percent but i personally didn't though when i graduated from high school and I got married and moved out and was on my own, I started working full time as a pharmacy tech. So I was mm. commuting um, to the, the next town over from us and, you know, commuting was about 36 miles round trip every day. My husband was working a day job off farm as well. And so there's a reason that convenience foods rose, right? And there's the, the popularity of them and the ease of them and, and all of that. And so I found myself grabbing those things. So I was still cooking cooking quote unquote at home we still had a garden you know so yes. i was still growing stuff and, and doing that stuff but i really found that i was relying much more on assembling items and heating them up than truly cooking and then i i had a lot of health implications that developed from that yeah. uh, which we can can or cannot decide to get into um so that was really my catalyst for me was to getting back to raising and doing more of our own selves once I hit that point. And thankfully, I had a lot of those skill sets or, or memories or could go to my parents and say, like, you know, help me, walk me through this. How do we do this? So it wasn't starting from scratch like someone who has no background to it. But I also had to figure out a way to do it while still working a full time day job, whereas my mom was a stay at home mom, you know, and, and my grandmother and that. And so it really was one of the first women in our family line that had to combine those while not being at home full time. So I had to figure mm -hmm. out that balance and systems and how do we make this work uh, when my husband and I are both gone during the day at the day job. Correct. Yeah. So you were, instead of being a producer, you're more, as you said, you were an assembler. Yeah. Interesting. I never thought about it that way. Uh, so you did mention the health challenges. What kind of, was there something that pulled you back to this? Was there like, we need to change because of X? Yes. So um, after I had my second child, it's any any pregnant woman or if you've ever had pregnant women in your life know like you got heartburn when you're pregnant, like very yes. normal thing. So my first child, my son, after I had him, heartburn went away. So I got pregnant with my daughter and of course heartburn came back and I'm like, oh yeah, like as soon as I have her, like this will go back down and, and we'll return to normal. Mm. After I had her, the heartburn didn't go away. In fact, it, it continued to progress and it got mm. worse and worse and worse. And so I was on max prescription medications at, at the very worst before I went in to have actually have an endoscope and, and a biopsy done. Um, I was taking different prescription medications uh, six times a day, like having oh, wow. to time my meals around them. Yeah and still not having any relief, like having very severe symptoms. So I went in and they were going to just do an endoscope because all of my, my lab work, um, you know, didn't have H pylori, like all of the things that are kind of normal trigger factors weren't coming up for me. So I went in and when they were doing the endoscope, they actually found two spots, one on my esophagus and one on my upper stomach that they decided to biopsy for cancer. So we got the test results back and thankfully it was benign. I did not have cancer, but it showed that I had a lot of erosion. And at that mm. time I was in my late twenties, had a lot of erosion and I had the cellular change, which is basically your precursor to precancerous cells, right? So the specialist um, said, hey, you have one got to come off these medications. You shouldn't have been on them at these doses for this prolonged period of time to begin with. Yeah. And second, if you don't figure out how to control this acid to get that erosion in those cells back to a normal state, you know, the next time you come in here, it's not going to be a benign test result. So that was huge. I mean, I had a four-year-old at home. Mm -hmm. I was in my late 20s and I had this infant. 
And I remember driving home and I had this stack of papers that he said kind of, you know, go through to look at triggers and diet, you know, all these different things. Mm -hmm. And I remember driving home because it's a very long drive. And I'm like, I have this moment right now that I can decide to figure this out by the food, like figure out what this plan is and turn things around. Or I'm going to continue on this path and I might not be here when my kids walk down the aisle. Um, and so it was a very defining mm-hmm. moment for me. And I decided I'm going to figure this out. And so I started looking at all of the ingredients in my cupboard and educating myself. I mean, and this was like 15 years ago now, yeah. but educating myself on genetically modified foods and actually hydrogenated fats versus non hydrogenated, like all of these things. And I got out this huge black garbage can and I just started tossing stuff. If I didn't know, you know, if I had high fructose corn syrup, like all of the things that I feel is a lot more commonplace now, thankfully. And I just made that switch. And what's fascinating to me is within making that switch, within six months, I was off all of the medications, having no breakthrough symptoms and have been completely healed from that and have never had to go back on of them. And that was simply from making those drastic food changes, which also brought me back to raising more of it ourselves because there was a lot of those things at that point in time either weren't available on the market like they are now or we couldn't afford them. And I'm like, well, I know how to raise food. So, you know, that type of so it was kind of a, a twofold thing at that time. But we really then started upping a lot of our food production um, to the level that we do now, but was from that time period. Gotcha. So you kind of cleaned house. Yes. <laughs> well, and I think back then, too, there wasn't the resources you have now about these partially hydrogenated oils. I mean, just and, and because when I was growing up, you know, you were using Crisco because that made the best pie crust. I remember that. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, um, vegetable oil was, you know, it's vegetable oil. It's better than lard. Or that's right. what they said. That's what they uh, said. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, I grew up with two, and just trying to think through my, both grandparents were very conventional kitchen in the kitchen. And my parents were the ones that made us go vegan for about two years. Um, And it was one of those things, they they just got upset about conventional food. And their reaction to that was just completely clean the house of all meat, which shouldn't have gone there. But anyway, um, we're back. So (laughs) that's the good part. But um, I I, I completely understand that. Now, so that changed. I mean, like you got a lot healthier. Did that also trigger you to start looking at other areas of your life and saying, wait a minute, if this made such a big change, let's maybe look in the the beauty cupboard. Oh, goodness. Yes. Yeah. It was really everything. It was once I I saw that on food, then I started looking at, yes, cosmetics, uh, toiletries, you know, all of those things, your shampoo, your toothpaste, I mean, you mm-hmm. name it, down the road. Cleaning supplies was another huge one. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it, you just, you name it, and went down the rabbit hole from there um, in a good way. Yeah. Well, I think, too, is when you do that, yes, you're going to spend some more money some places, but you also, because a lot of what's out there is just manufactured marketing, you can save a lot, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, and what's interesting is because I I got to, um, we did have health insurance, but we still had deductibles and all that. And so I got to see what those bills were like when when you're paying for all of those things. Mm -hmm. And so the difference that I saved, even though, yes, there were some things that we were paying more for, um, it still was way cheaper than having those medical bills and those prescription prescription costs every single month. Um, And not to mention just actual quality of life. Like, it's really hard to put a price tag on that. But if I were to, to put them in, mm-hmm. you know, two categories side by side, it's still cheaper for me to buy the better ingredients, um, et cetera, in mm-hmm. the long run than it was the other way. Well, just who has time to go sit in six different doctor's offices? And if you start put a time aspect on it, um, we had to take my son in, I think it's maybe a year ago now for some stitches because he was seven and six and dancing around and i think it was nine stitches and the bill ended up being like three thousand dollars which is ridiculous um so we're self-pay and so we negotiated it down i think by like 40 percent but healthcare is unbelievable and um you did that aspect of yes don't because you have these health problems and because you're not willing to stop eating the way you are um it's it's two-thirds of the reason why people don't go to the doctor 
Yeah. Well, and it's really interesting because honestly, Michael, like I worked in as a pharmacy tech for 18 mm-hmm. years. So I worked in, you know, traditional Western medicine society, saw a lot that was broken during that time. But honestly, I don't know before I went through that myself. I mean, maybe it was, you know, age. I'm obviously a lot older now. I don't know that I truly would have believed until I went through it myself and saw it that tr- just by changing the foods that I was eating would truly have that amount of impact and healing that it did. It didn't quite register. Mm-mm. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So now you're through this, you're growing your own garden. When did you start educating others? Yeah. So what's really funny is I'd always done some amount of gardening and canning. So there was always some of that, but it was just very select crops and select items. So I already had people that were naturally, like I would teach locally um, Mm -hmm. and teach local canning classes and and different things like that. And then really it was in about a year, no, two years after I started going through this process. And of course you, you start talking to everybody who will listen about it when you see this type of transformation. And so I started sharing about it on my website. I always knew from the time I was a little girl that I wanted to be an author. And so I was actually going to writers uh, retreats and conferences and the editors that I was speaking with at the time, and as well as literary agents are like, well, you need to have a platform. You need to have a blog. You need to have an email list, like all of these things to be considered before publishing. And I'm like, okay, great. So I went and started a blog and I'm like, well, what am I going to write about? And at that time, I thought I was going to be a historical fiction author. And okay. so I'm like, well, my heroine is, is cooking, you know, over a campfire, you know, set in the, the 1800s. And we did a lot of that already, used cast iron and cooked outdoors with Dutch ovens. And so I'm like, well, I'll just share some of those recipes and some of those types of tutorials. And that would be the tie in because this is what my heroine is doing in my mind. So I just started doing that, started sharing it. And people just kept asking for, well, do you have a recipe on this? Well, how do you do that? Can you make a tutorial on X, Y, Z? So I just kept on doing that and building up the email list and had no idea what to do with the email list other than just to email them every week when I put up a new free recipe or a new free yeah. tutorial, you know? So it naturally grew from grew from that. And then it reached the point where, okay, I have people who are wanting videos every week now and I'm already doing the podcast. So I have to figure out a way that this is going to make sense for my time and finances in order to invest more, or I'm mm-hmm. going to have to scale back, but I can't keep doing the homesteading and this and working my day job as a pharmacy tech. Like, and so that was kind of the pivotal point for me mm-hmm. um, in 2016 when I started my online membership um, and online courses and then made the full leap in 2018 uh, to do it full time and retired from pharmacy work. Gotcha. Okay. So then you also have the magazine. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So Homestead Living, Homesteading Monthly um, is a magazine we started a couple of years ago. And it was really where I saw a need for myself too. Like when I was reading and looking at magazines, like there's gardening magazines that are out there. You know, there's different livestock magazines that are out there. But I wasn't seeing a publication that was truly all of the aspects of homesteading life. Mm -hmm. And people are wanting print. Like we have a lot of digital, like, you know, this is digital. And I I love the things that the good things that have come from digital. There's a lot that has actually came good out of digital and online. But a lot of us are really hungry for having those print items to be able to sit and to go through them, uh, to not have, you know, the screen on while you're cooking, you know, to be able to just follow this recipe in print. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, is being able to help vet and give voice to people who are super experienced and are experts in that field, but they might not have this huge online presence, but man, do they know their stuff. So being able to give voice and to make sure that that knowledge can get out there along with the folks who do have you know a large online presence and also know their stuff as well. So it's kind of that marrying together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's really where, where Homesteading Monthly um, was kind of that, seeing that that need, um, not seeing anything available, and then being able to come together and, and help create that and get that out. Gotcha. And so then what kind of, like if someone's going to, thinking about the magazine, what kind of, of uh, areas do you kind of deliver every single month? 
Yeah. So we kind of have our, our pillar areas of, of homesteading. And so some of that, of course, is always going to be covering some aspect of, of livestock. So it might be a specific type of livestock, like here's a, you know, a deep down on sheep, or it might be a, a larger overview. Joel Salatin writes for us. He has a monthly column with us, you know, so it may be Joel talking more about mob grazing or doing different pasture rotation with multiple species. So always something livestock related. Um, but as I said, it might not be chickens every single month, right? So there's variants yeah. there. Um, and then we always have something in the kitchen. Um, so rather that be a preserving recipe or how to cook something or, uh, you know, from scratch, that type of thing. Um, of course, gardening. So we always have some aspect of gardening and usually always some type of aspect of some type of natural herbalism or hol holistic health. Um, okay. that's in there and then usually we have like some some inspire inspiring pieces uh, maybe bringing awareness to something that type of thing so really a mix of the practical how-to but also that that inspiration and that story part um, so those are always fun to have kind of that mix because I've been doing this for so long now and I think anybody who moves into farming or homesteading or variation they're in it is hard work like it's very rewarding and I'm super mm -hmm. passionate about it, but there's no getting around. It truly is hard work. And so I find that I really look forward to that inspiration part. Like I need to be like, I need mm -hmm. that cheerleader in my ear. That's like, yes, like this yeah. matters. And it kind of give me that, that rejuvenation. So that's kind of, we wanted to be able to deliver that um, every month in mm -hmm. one publication. So let's dive into that inspiration aspect. And I think that what we or, need there too is that community aspect of just finding those that are doing the same thing um talk just kind of expound a little bit on community yeah community is really huge and honestly the homesteading movement a, a lot of times we use the word uh, sustainability or self-sufficiency and i really don't like the term self-sufficiency because it's false when you look back even historically at homesteaders of old um, yes, they, they were sustainable in a lot of ways, but they came together for barn raising. Uh, they still were taking a lot of their grain to the local mill. It was being done locally at the local mill, and then they would bring it home. They were going, you know, still to the general store, you know, trading things. But it was a much more localized community that created community sufficiency. And so that's really with, with homesteading where I would like to see it come, and I think that it is, um, because... For example, we had a milk cow um, and ended up losing her. She had a, a, a really hard breech birth and wasn't able to recover. And so I know what that takes to have your milk cow, to produce all of your own beef, almost all of your own produce and all of that. But I have a gal actually is about 18 miles away from me, but as far out as I live, that's pretty local, um, who yeah. has a raw milk dairy and does a wonderful job. And so I am getting my milk from her. Um, I don't need to have a dairy cow of my own at this moment in time. So being able to have enable more and more people to really specialize so that not everybody's having to do it all per se um, and are able to support one another. And it may even be, you know, we've got people in our community who are never going to homestead to the degree that we are for whatever reason, but they would still buy these local items that are supported from people that's going to help, you know, supply chains and just all, all of those things. Um, but also foster that something very different when you are going to the person and picking it up there or driving by it and seeing where it's raised. I mean, you have a very different connection. And I have to say for the short period of time, we had our dairy cow for about a year. Um, I met people on my road. I've lived on my road my entire life. So for 43 yeah. years, I've lived on this road. I met people that have been in my neighborhood for 20 years that I maybe just knew their face in passing, but had never had conversations with. And they came and I got to know them. We're still really great friends. Um, and so there is just something to that connection level with homesteading, but creating that community aspect. And it's a sharing of, you know, different things like that, that I think we're really missing. And as much as I love digital, and if you don't have that where you live, digital can definitely help with that. I, I am so happy that I have a digital community, but there truly is nothing like having people in your local community uh, to, to rely on and to support. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's also why the live events with especially for homesteaders are great too, because I think sometimes there are few and far of us between, um, like you said, when you started that, that cow, when you started building that aspect of things that just brought people out of the woodwork. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that's important too, why these live events are great because you get to meet all those people that um, are a lot of times so busy on their homestead, they don't have a chance to stop by and talk. Yeah, live events. I have to say, um, live events, I have made from those live events, both locally and also people that I only get to see at, at the live events. Um, but some of my, my deepest friendships actually have been born from going to a live event. So there is very something special about going to a live event, both for relationship building um, and also mm-hmm. skill set building. Because a lot of these skills aren't something that's so commonplace anymore. Uh, yes, you can watch things online, but there's truly nothing like learning in person. It just gets in your brain in, in a different way. Yeah, and I think because learning online is typically one way, while you're in person, it's way more two-way. Yeah. Are you ready to transform your strawberry growing skills? We want to share our 16 years of experience with growing and profiting from strawberries with you in our free three-day strawberry workshop. Learn proven techniques for boosting yield and flavor, tips for managing your harvest, and even developing your own U-Pick operation. This workshop is perfect for farmers, homesteaders, and gardeners looking to extend your strawberry growing season and make some money in return. The three-day online workshop is offered weekly, but register now. This is only available for a few more weeks. Sign up at strawberrysuccess.com. That is strawberrysuccess.com. So talk a little bit about the, um, you do the podcast too, and kind of what's your focus with that? Yeah. So the Pioneer Today podcast is really all things, all things homesteading, which is kind of a, a large umbrella. So we definitely talk about different health things there. We talk about gardening. We talk about preserving your food, cooking from scratch. So barnyard, home, health, really the whole gamut of that, as well as just that's the place where I feel like I can be very real and honest with people. I mean, not that I'm not honest everywhere, but I feel like that's a place that I can go really in depth with the audience and just be really upfront. Like, Hey, this is where we're scaling back this year. Like we kind of burn ourselves out last year. So this is the adjustments that we're making. Um, and can just share some of that behind the scene things that for whatever reason, I feel the most comfortable sharing that in, in the podcast space. I think there's something about podcasting I'm a podcast junkie. I love listening to podcasts. It's my favorite mode of, of learning. Um, mm-hmm. But when they're in, someone's in my earbud and I'm listening to someone else's is podcast, it's different than me watching a video. I, it Correct. feels like a more intimate connection, even though obviously I've never met the people in most cases um, yeah. that I'm listening to. So I think that I transfer that and also share maybe in a little bit different manner on the podcast um, than, I, than I do on like the YouTube channel or Instagram posts or that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, do you do interviews or is it more just a topic, pick a topic and go? Yeah, we we do both. So I do what I call solo episodes. And so I usually do a solo episode and that's kind of me either just going really in depth on something, you know, in my uh, expertise, for lack of a better word, just where I'll be talking about. And then we also bring in guests. Um, And so it's a combination of both. Usually I do an episode every week. Um, And so we kind of just toggle back and forth every other, um, every other week will be solo episode and then we'll bring on a guest and do an interview. Very cool. And then you have a a conference as well. Talk to how that started. Yeah. So the Modern Home Setting Conference, it's coming up this June. It's always the last Friday and Saturday of June in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And that really came up because I had the honor and and privilege of being asked to speak at a lot of different home setting conferences as they started Um, popping up, but they were all on the East Coast. So I was traveling to Virginia and to Tennessee and to Georgia, which was great. And I was sharing with my audience and and like I they were very exciting. Like I had never been at an in-person event with homesteaders before. To And I was yeah. like, the energy, like it was uh, life-changing and amazing. So I was sharing about this with my audience and I kept having people say like, oh my gosh, like when will there be one in the West? Like, please let me know when there's one on the, on the West Coast. Like I just can't travel that far, but I really want to go to one. And I'm like, hey, as soon as I hear of one on the West Coast, like I will broadcast that to the ninth degree. Mm-hmm. And a couple years went by and I wasn't seeing any on the West Coast. And so I met... Um, uh, now my partner, co-partner, co-founder of the Modern Home Sitting Conference, Katie Milhorn, um, she was going to the East Coast conferences as well. And I said, hey, I can't pull this off on my own, but would you be willing to partner up? And if we put one on in the West, like, will you help do it? And yeah. she was like, 100%. So it's kind of one of those things, like you keep looking around for someone to do it. And sometimes that means you're the person to do it. So 
this is our second year. Last year was our first year doing it. And um, it's been so exciting to see so many people um, coming out to it and learning. And what was really cool is last year, we had people who met for the first time at conference and then they became friends and they would tag us when they went to each other's houses. And now they're oh, you know, fun. tagging yeah. us being like, hey, we're meeting up. It's like our, our an- friend anniversary, you know, um, yeah. at this year. So that's been really cool to see um, meaningful, lifelong, you know, relationships being uh, founded, founded there. So it's been really fun. Yeah. Um, let's shift kind of a little bit here and talk about just homesteading in general and some of the things I see, some of the challenges I see. I think one of the first one I see is someone who, okay, maybe get this idea of what they need to do and they go try to do everything. Yeah. And it's very tempting, right? And with homesteading, some of the things I'm like, one of the great things about homesteading is it's very hard to get bored because there's so many facets to it, right? Yes. But on the other hand, it can get very overwhelming and burnout can be a very real thing. What I've noticed is a lot of people jumped into homesteading. That was kind of their springboard when the pandemic hit. And so now we're like about, if I can do math, we're about three, four years out from that, depending on at what point people like, I'm like, man, I'm really going to do this. And so you, what I see is people jump in and the first few years is kind of that honeymoon phase, right? You're still super passionate. You're super excited. It's still new when you're like gung ho, but then the reality and the long term and the work at about two years, I see that kind of be the burnout phase for a lot of people with homesteading. And so I'll either see they'll start to sell off livestock, um, you know, they start to pull back from it. Sometimes they sell the entire property and move back in, into the city, like varying degrees there. And mm-hmm. so you do definitely want to pace yourself. I mean, and it's kind of true with, with anything, right? It needs to be a lifestyle and a longevity. And most people aren't going to be able to completely flip everything and and stay there we tend to gravitate back towards habits so my best advice is to pick a couple of areas that maybe this is where you're going to pick one major thing of livestock if you're going to pick a couple main crops in a garden if you've never gardened before you know it's going to depend on where your starting point is but pick a few things that are your top priority get those accomplished so that they become a part of your daily routine. It's very normal. You're totally used to it. It's like, man, I don't stress about this anymore. And then add on the next thing. And that way you're continually growing and expanding, but you're doing so in a way that is very sustainable um, instead of burning out in, in two years. Yeah. I think we've all seen those properties that someone, you know, they spend probably a million dollars on <laughs> and then you're like, Oh my gosh. And things like partially set up and then they put it online and you're like, okay, that happened there too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sad um, because I'm sure there's a lot of loss there, but I, I think that kind of leads us also to a second question here or, or kind of point is what about getting the spouse on board? Because I think that can also be just as challenging. <laughs> yes, it can be. In fact, that is a very common question when I get asked a lot and I think for part of it is for your your family, your whole family, especially you know if you have children, depending on their ages, but spouses as well, um, is really trying to communicate the why to them. Um, because I know even with my my own children, so my son was about four when we really started to make these changes. And so my daughter was an infant, so she didn't really know any different, but he did. And it was like, we are not going to McDonald's anymore. Like, ever. I am never buying you McDonald's foods. Well, telling that to a four or five-year-old when when in the past you have, like, that's kind of hard for them to get on board with, you know? So I pulled up online the videos on YouTube that actually showed where they, like, go in and look at a chicken nugget and, like, the weird stuff that's in there, you know? So I I shared that with age appropriate, of course. But once he saw that so that he could understand the why behind it, then he was like, okay, mom. And he never asked to go there and have that food again. Now, I know that's a very simplistic example, but I think, you know, with with my spouse, like, is just getting them to understand that why, why it's so important to you, um, your motivation, et cetera. It still might not get them fully on board the way you are, but I think when we understand the why, you know, same thing, if my husband wants to make a change and he just says, hey, we're doing X, Y, Z, I might be like, say what but if I understand this deep reasoning behind it and why it's so important to them it tends to have a little bit different different shift 
Um, and then also trying to find areas within homesteading, a, true with spouse and with kids, but there are some areas that some people enjoy way more than others. So if that can find what it is that they enjoy or what they can resonate with, et cetera, and have them help or be accountable or in charge of those areas, and you do the thing, other things. So for example, um, my husband really doesn't like chickens. He okay. likes the cattle. So I predominantly am the one that are, are feeding the chickens and moving the chicken tractors. I pretty much take care of the chicken, except on butcher day. He is a rock star when it comes to butcher day on chickens. Because um, he's getting rid of them, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and so I help with some of the fence building and I help with feeding the cow. You know, like it, there is a joint effort there. But overall, yeah. he is the one that is going to be feeding the cows and doing the majority of the stuff with the cows. I'm doing the majority of stuff with the chickens. Um, and that. You know, and so just kind of finding some of those balances, kind of the same thing with the kids. Um, my son, like his dad, really doesn't like the chickens, but he does like the cows and like he enjoys other aspects. So having him help with those things um, can help. And sometimes it is just saying like, hey, everybody, like I need your help on X, Y, Z. Like everybody's going to jump in. Um, but yeah. And also like when I think there's been a lot of times... <laughs> And I don't know, maybe everybody else's marriage isn't like this, but like I can tell my husband something and it's kind of like, okay, but then if, if he hears that information through another source, so it could be a Joe Rogan podcast perhaps, or <laughs> maybe it's a documentary, then it's like, oh man, yeah. I see what you were saying. And then he's super on board. So I think this is yeah. just knowing also communication styles of, of the people in, in your life, of, of your spouse and your kids, et cetera, um, and figuring out a way to communicate it to them in a way that they can accept it and that they can understand. Yeah. And also being okay with, they might not be on board. So what can you do? What can you do where you are right now to move you towards that goal? Maybe it's not as much as you would like, um, but you, all of us, even in a marriage, right? Like we can really only control ourselves. So uh -huh. you need to control what it is you can do by yourself. And if they come alongside you, which is the goal, that's great. And if not, then at least you're still making forward progress. Yeah. And you always see those horror stories of like, well, my husband just ran over my whole flower thing or this or that. And it's, I mean, you feel so bad, but, um, but back to your point about like someone else telling them that, that was me and microplastics. Cause my wife was, you know, sending me articles, sending me this, and then it was a Joe Rogan podcast where it was about, yes, you know, sperm counts are, you know, 50% of once they once were, and we're like, it's like, oh, okay. So I guess we need to think about this. <laughs> yeah. Right? And to be fair, there's plenty my husband's told me that I'm like, yeah, whatever. And then I hear from other source, and I'm like, oh, I should have paid more attention to that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I think, like, especially, I think another thing, too, like equipment. There's some people that should never be on equipment, and there's some people that love tinkering and doing that. And so letting people do what they're good at um, is super important and seeing what they can. And I think other people too, another aspect is they just don't feel qualified. And so it overwhelms them. And so giving them like a little tiny bit, you know, I need you to do this one thing till the garden. Um, I don't need you to plant the garden. I don't need you to do anything else, but you know, till the garden, make the trellis. I think that, you know, they can have a nice thing to go work on. Yeah. Yeah. It's really key is, is, Enabling anybody and helping them have confidence in something is also really key. So I think it comes down to knowing knowing people's learning habits, knowing how they work best, you know, how they communicate, and and then trying to follow that as much as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, do, do you see just a continuing uh, explosion of homesteading? Uh, what, where do you see this going? Yeah, that's a great question. So I. I had, I've seen homesteading since I came into the like online digital space, which was in late 2011 is when I started my website and, and social media presence and all that kind of stuff. So it was on an upward trend from that time. But then when the pandemic hit, that really exploded things. I'm starting to see now a little bit of settling from that. So some of the people who were on board, right, you know, when the pandemic and, and however many years after that, um, some of them have kind of slid slid back but I, I am still seeing it i don't think we've hit the peak as far as people's interest and people coming to this way of life it slowed down a little bit from the growth rate we had from the pandemic but yeah. i don't see it going backwards or really even stabilizing right now just a not quite as strong a peak yeah um 
And I think that you're always going to see that somewhat, especially because it's now back to normal. And I think a lot of people were making the changes when they couldn't get yeast and mm -hmm. they had to sequester at home. But now that they're back to the nine to five and the, the soccer mom, they just don't have time for it. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because it's a great way to live. But um, yeah. yeah, the soccer mom, shame is pretty strong. Yeah. And I had to, to be fair, though, there's been a lot of folks that came to it that I don't think would have, or at least not that soon, that have uh -huh. stayed with it. I mean, we have definitely seen seen a drop off. Um, yeah. But I think overall, more people um, have stayed with it and are doing it than would have had we not had the yeah. those circumstances. Yeah. Yep. Now you're also on YouTube. What is your top YouTube video? My very top YouTube video is actually a no need bread recipe video. Okay. Yeah. That came out during the pandemic, which I'm sure helped helped with yeah. those views. Yeah. Yeah. Because people were trying to make bread and all that. Yeah. Very cool. And then what is the kind of like, what's your goal with the YouTube channel? Is that the more longer form content? Yeah. The YouTube channel is definitely the, the longer form longer form content. So it's where I can, you know, and it really is, it's educational. I mean, there's a little bit of um, entertainment in there. Like I, you mm -hmm. know, I'll show blooper reels or, you know, that type of thing, but it really is an educational channel. Um, so it's just a chance for me to be able to, to teach, um, you know, to show and to share people with what we're doing and um, that type of thing. And then also to be able to provide some of the inspiration as well um, together, um, so, but definitely the longer form content is housed on YouTube. Yeah. Gotcha. And then what have you seen? What would you say the number one question you get in uh, like on YouTube or number one, I guess maybe not specific question, but like topic that people are like really passionate about or interested in? Yeah. Well, interestingly is part of this is I'm not sure if this is YouTube algorithm or perhaps just the way that I did those videos, but I feel like the gardening and the growing content, especially of plants, probably too, that's more accessible. More people are going to be able to garden and, and to grow, mm -hmm. you know, plants and whatnot than they are raised livestock necessarily. Um, but I find that people really seem to enjoy the gardening content and that is what performs overall the best for me. Um, and then second to that would definitely be the preserving of food mm -hmm. preservation. Yeah. Yeah, because now you got you grew it, so now you got to do something with it. Right. You don't want to go to waste. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like our farm, we're an eight-acre urban farm, and we don't have any animals. Uh, and we could, but we've just chosen to grow things that stay where they're planted. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of saying that. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. Um, what would you say to the new homesteader? You know, someone who maybe they heard a podcast or, you know, th th they just decided they're tired of the... Um, perfectly manicured McMansion. Yeah. I, you know, start with where you are right now. I, I think this is true for any goal that you have in life is to just get started today. It's never going to be perfect. Uh, there's never a perfect time. Um, but if you just start with where you are, and again, it's kind of that building, building of things. Start with where you are right now with what you can do today. And then just build upon that as time allows. Because honestly, if you were to win the lottery today and be able to go and buy that perfect dream property or acreage and all the livestock and stuff that you wanted, if money was no object, if you didn't have any of the skill sets to begin with, again, like that's actually not going to solve all your, all your problems. You're still going to have to learn all of that. So just start where you are right now with what you can. And that has a snowball effect as well. Not only will you be able to gain more skill sets, but it will also open up your eyes to areas that if you did live maybe out in the country that you wouldn't even see available to you and, and kind of help you, I, this term is so overused, but to think outside the box, you know, maybe it's a, a median on your, um, in an area that's got grass that you can grow on, um, or it's starting a community garden or, you know, something along those lines um, that's very very helpful. And I love seeing some of the things that people are doing, even in those suburban and urban settings that are really incredible that if they were able to have that dream property and move out, those things would have never happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You remind me of someone who, um, he calls himself the homestead realtor and they basically started in their backyard in California and got to the point where they were just the weirdest person in the neighborhood. It made sense to move to Tennessee. But, um, you know, it's, it's that aspect of you've got to start somewhere. 
Yeah. Yeah. Tim and Sophia's story is, is very inspiring, but also a, a perfect example of the point we're making. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom and expertise. And um, yeah, it was, uh, enjoyed having the conversation. Yeah, thanks. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.